14. And again, if you're able, please stand with me in the reading of God's holy word. Aren't you thankful that you live in a free country and that you can have the Bible? I read somewhere once before, I'm going to butcher the numbers, but I think it's like 60%, maybe 50% of the world don't have a Bible. And that's a, that's a sad, sad scenario. Well, thank God we live in a place that we can have a Bible, and it is still free to be able to read the Bible and worship together. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, 14, the Bible says this, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Father God, we come before you this morning to say thank you, Lord. We're just grateful for all that you do for us. We're grateful that you love us. You have mercy, you're long-suffering, that's for sure. And we appreciate all that, God. We thank you for the moment, the opportunity that you opened our eyes via the Holy Spirit of God, convicting our hearts with the truth of the Word of God that we were sinners in need of salvation. Father, I pray that everybody can say, yes, that's me. I've been born again. The way to get into the kingdom of heaven, Lord God, you tell us that in your Bible. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Lord. So I'm thankful for the moment, that day, that you provided the gospel to me, Lord. And I'm sure, sure that everybody else here as well. Father, you've given us salvation. Truthfully, you've given us liberty, Lord. But may we learn and recognize to use that liberty for your honor and your glory and not for our own will or desire. Help me this morning, God. Guide my words. Guide my heart. I want to say everything that the Word of God says, not what I say, Lord, and I pray that you'd help me with it. So I thank you again for salvation. If anybody here is lost, that you'd save them. I pray those of us that are, Lord, just draw us close to thee. We pray for your protection. We pray that you'd ward off any hindrance of anything, Lord. No principalities or darkness, dear God, but that we're completely attentive to your holy word. I love you. I thank you. Holy Spirit, have your religion. In Jesus' name. I appreciate you standing. You can be seated. I said moments ago, I'm thankful that we live in a free country. Uh, I'm thankful that we do have freedom. But truthfully, there are some limitations to that freedom, right? Uh, you might be looking at me like I'm crazy. Well, we live in New York, so you know that some of those are, are pretty restricted, right? So you do recognize some of the things that I'm saying. Though we live in a free country, there are still some laws, rules, regulation to maintain that freedom, right? I'm, again, I'm thankful that... Uh, just because you don't like me, you can't take my life. And if you take my life, I'm going to heaven, so I'm okay with that. But I'm thankful that just because somebody doesn't like me, they can't just come and take my life, and that would be legal. I'm thankful that people, because they like my car or my house, just can't come and take that. What I'm trying to say is I'm grateful for some laws and rules and regulations that are established. Can I say it? Guidelines that maintain that freedom. A lot of times, maybe you've heard it this way, I know. Uh, that I've heard it several times. There's a ditch on the right, there's a ditch in the left, and we want to just remain in that middle so we don't fall in the ditch to the right or fall in the ditch to the left. So we have complete freedom, no doubt, in this country, but there are limitations to that freedom. That would make sense. Hopefully we would understand that. God did the exact same thing. When he took the nation of Israel out of uh, Egypt, right, what, did, what happened? He's up on Mount Sinai, and he's receiving what? The law, the commandments. Many of those give us the civil government that we have today. Now, we're not going to argue about politics. I recognize there are differences that are going on and all of that. I recognize that. But the main root of many of those civil laws, the, uh, the authority of the government that is today, comes from biblical principles. God saw fit that that was needed as they left the nation of Egypt to have some guidelines, some rules and regulations to maintain that, right? Some of those were... You can't kill, you can't steal, you can't commit adultery, you can't lie, right? So we're grateful for those guidelines that have been provided for us. Now listen, I'm not saying that you have to be happy with all of them, right? I made the joke we live in New York. But I'm going to tell you this, you ought to be accepting and happy for the rules, regulations, and guidelines that God sets down for us. They are there for our protection. I know there's a mindset out there, I'll discuss a little bit of it, that it's legalism, uh, that we follow the Word of God. It is not legalism that we follow the Word of God. It's not legalism that God tells us not to lie. It's not legalism that God wants us to utilize our spiritual gifts in His local New Testament church as we've been talking about. It's not legalization or legalism because you have to serve and surrender your life to God. None of those are legalism, okay? Legalism is saying that I have to do those things 
to earn something. And we're going to discuss that here in just a moment. Matter of fact, the whole book of Galatians really talks about what legalism is really about. You have to fulfill everything in the law to be saved. Specifically, they'll be talking about circumcision as we focus in on here, which they tried to recreate. And Paul calls this thing a perverted gospel. You with me? Please understand the difference between legalism and following biblical principles. Now, let me just say it this way. You're not your own. You're bought with a price, right? You cannot, again, hold your jokes, you cannot come to America and do what you want to do, right? You have to fulfill what the American laws and governments tell you to do, right? You can't just move into this country and set up your own government, try to do whatever you want to do, right? So it makes sense. We understand that. How many of you get to go to work and tell the boss what you want to do? Does it pan out very well, does it? How about if you go to McDonald's? God bless you. If you go to McDonald's and you end up with a Whopper, are you going to be happy? No. We would say, okay, all of these things make sense. But then when it comes to my liberty and how I'm to live my life for God, now I got a problem dealing with this. So there are limitations to our freedom. Liberty is not to be used for the occasion of our flesh, he tells us there in verse 13. We're going to dive into that just a little bit here in a moment. But we have this liberty to live our life for God, specifically, as he says in verse 13, but by love serve one another. Now, God has given us some guidelines, has he not? He sure has. He's given us a guideline that's called the Word of God. If you were to turn back to Romans and read through that book, you'd find where there was a question that was posed in Romans chapter 6. As he's talking about the law and the differences and liberty and having this freedom, the question is posed, and I want to read it verbatim, even though it's on the tip of my tongue. Let me read it to you. It says this, uh, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the question that's posed. In other words... Thank you for saving me, God. I'm just going to live the way that I want to live. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And your promise <laughs> that we got from his word says that when I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, I have an everlasting home in heaven. Now, I'm going to claim that promise. I'm going to hang on to that. But what I'm going to do now, God, is close this thing, and I'm going to live the way that I want to live. Now, you might be saying, well, preacher... I, I read all these wonderful books by all these different uh, religious individuals, and they tell me all of these different things. Okay, praise God for that. That's a lie. Don't praise God for that. Some of those books, many of those books, are heresy. They're, they're false doctrine. They, they're not telling you what the Word of God says. And can I just say it this way with a loving heart? Who cares what Joe and Billy and Susie and Sally write? What does the Word of God say? If the word of God was enough to prick your heart unto salvation, isn't the word of God enough for you to live your life in honor and glory for God? Do we not trust God for eternal life? We would say yes. Well, then do you not trust God for him to manage your life? He's keeping your eternal life. He's keeping your salvation. We think we can do better than God. So what we do is we say we claim grace. We're in the grace period, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah, we're in the love and grace. Jesus came. Uh, he came to just offer himself on the cross of Calvary to provide for you everlasting life, and that's it. He just came for you to have an eternal home in heaven. After that, you just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Well, that's the question that posed. Shall we continue in sin? And the answer directly after that is, God forbid. Now, again, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but if I go to college, again, keep your jokes to yourself, if I go to college, I expect to get that education. If, 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 if I hire you to come to work, I expect you to work. If I go to McDonald's, I expect to get not a Whopper. I expect to not get a Wendy's chicken sandwich. I expect to get a McDonald's and, and then the doctor afterwards. I'm just kidding. Right? We have these expectations in life. Then the greatest expectation, the greatest the greatest blessing, the greatest answers from God, his book, his word, his Bible is given to us so that we can live a blessed life. And all of a sudden, no, 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 no. We live in grace. Therefore, I can do whatever I want to do. I can live this life the way that I want to live it. I'm still going to do good as it feels and seems fit to me. And God says, no, 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 no. You've been saved for the purpose of serving by love one to another. 
We're starting the personal evangelism class. I told you in Sunday school, and some of you might be sitting here and say, well, I've led a thousand people to the Lord. Praise God, then you come help us learn how to do it. I'm just saying, we're going to go through that for the purpose of knowing how to deal with people and bring the gospel to them. Is that not one of the many reasons why God left us here? Sure is. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. I am going to beat that dead horse. I work somewhere. I ought to give them an honest eight hours work. If I don't, it's stealing. God redeemed you, forgave you, blood washed you, and says, now go, live, serve with love. So we have liberty, absolutely, and we have guidelines to follow. Go with me, Galatians, you're there. Look in chapter 7. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7. We went to our text. We're going to come back to the text in just a moment, but I just want you to see a couple things here. In verse 7, he says this to the Galatian church. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey what? The truth. Paul's saying, man, you guys were on fire. You were doing what you're supposed to do for God. You got the gospel. You, you, the church was established. People were baptized. They joined the church. You guys are serving. You're utilizing your spiritual gifts within that church. There's life in that church. But now a few years down the road, there's a problem. Paul hits the nail on the head. He says, who hinders you from obeying the truth? What's Paul saying? What is stopping you from being obedient to the word of God? What is stopping you from following God's holy word? Please stop looking at this thing like it's negative and it lays restrictions on me and it keeps me from the fun of this world. Instead, look at it and say, thank God. He it to record down a way that I can honor and glorify God. Talking on Sunday nights, how I can be well-pleasing to God. How I can be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. How I can know how God wants me to live this life so that he can bless me in this life. We so often look at Christianity like it's a negative, restrictive thing. It's not. It is the, the, the way we glorify God and it brings the blessings of God upon our life. And again, let's beat some more dead horses. We live in America, in New York. We know what rules and regulations are. We know what laws are, right? We can't accept them. So therefore, we accept them and we live by them. But the blessed, holy, only wise, true God says, I have some same guidelines for you. So the question, who hinders you from obeying the truth? Verse 8, when we don't obey the truth. Before we read verse 8, you probably already looked at it. But preacher so-and-so said, an influencer so-and-so said, an internet so-and-so said, and an author so-and-so said, and, and my friend said, and my family said, that I should do this, preacher. Does what they say line up with, thus saith the Lord? Does what they say uh, increase my faith as I hear the word of God? Does what they say match what is the truth sanctify them through thy word thy word is truth okay it's a good question people are sincere look what he says in verse 8 this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth us we were in visitation yesterday and uh, my visiting partner told me it's good to be direct sometimes so I'm going to be direct this morning if it's not from God who's it from throw it out there it's from the devil, right? If it's not from above, then it's not of God, right? I know it's a direct statement, but we'll roll with it, okay? If, if, if Mr. So-and-so said it, and it doesn't match that, I'm not saying Mr. So-and-so is the devil, but what he gave you, it's not from above. Now, if it's not from above, it poses a problem, don't it? Can I meddle a little bit? If the salvation plan that you heard was not from above, where will you wake up when you die? In hell. You will wake up in a devil's hell. That's mean. Why would God do that to me? Why would God allow me to go or put me into a place of hell? Time on a court, friend. He didn't. He said, here's the holy word of God, and there's people that ought to be spreading it, and people ought to be preaching it, that it's only by Jesus Christ that you can get to heaven. So what do we do? We defend that. Praise God for that salvation by Jesus Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith. Yes, I believe that, but I don't want to follow anything else that's in that Bible. 
what hinders you from obeying the truth, please recognize this, please. If it's not from above, if it's not true, then it's a lie and it's of the devil. It's of the devil. Say, preacher, you're being a little harsh this morning. I'm not being harsh. I love you. God loves you. God provided the word of God to keep you from that place. God provided the word of God so that you could live in a place where you could receive the blessings of God. That's what he wants. And if we're not our own, we're bought with a price, then we have to obey the truth. And if salvation comes from above, and it's the only salvation that provides me a home in heaven, then the way that I live this life must, should, need, legal truth application. Verse 9. Here's why. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. <laughs> uh, it's, it's one little show. It's one little influencer. It's just one little internet person. I mean, he says he's a Christian. She says she's a Christian. She's under the banner. She talks about Jesus. He talks about Jesus. Okay, so he's a little bit off and says that you might need to be water baptism, but everything else is good to go. Uh, he's a little off and, and he wants to put more of his wording in there or he's off on his type of uh, the word of God, but it's, it's just a little thing and there's some other good things that are within that. It's okay. It's only one little sin in my life. It's not a big deal. It's only one section of my life that I don't obey. Surely we live in grace, God understands. A little leaven. Leaveneth the whole lump. Now, I'm not a baker, so I had to go and look this up. I know that leaven is sin, and I know that it rises. But I had to look it up. I was curious. Leaven basically puts like a gas within the bread to make it swell up and make it airy and make it like we like to eat it. <laughs> You get rid of the leaven, it's like leaving your bread out for a week, and then you eat it, I guess. But the leaven gets in there, a little bit of leaven, and it goes through the entire lump of bread to swell that thing up. Can I just say it this way? That little bit of leaven affected that whole loaf of bread to be the bread that it is. And from what I understand, it takes a little bit. When, the, when they would uh, celebrate the Passover... Does anybody remember the amount of days there could be no leaven in the house? Seven days. Seven days. So if I used a good old-fashioned skillet and it had leaven on it, we're coming to the Passover, guess what happened to the skillet? It's got to be out of the house for seven days. The fork that I used for leaven, it's got to be out of the house. I have to be vacant of any of that leaven within the house for seven days. All that's illustrating is the purification of Jesus Christ, the purity of God, okay? Now let's apply that. If leaven is sin, and it's one little bitty sin, nobody's going to, it's just a little bitty thing, what does the Bible tell us? It will affect your entire life. It's like a cancer. Would you want one cell of cancer in your body? I was going to use an illustration that my pops gave me, but I'm going to change it a little bit. <laughs> one, one, I, you're 32 ounce, you okay with that? It's a little bit, it's just a little thing. God saved me. I have liberty. I live in grace. Leaven also resemblance a haughty mind. What's a haughty mind? It's one that swells up. It's a lack of humility. It's a lack of meekness. Leads to pride. And we know that pride leads to a fall. Paul's dealing with a church who's going back from grace to following the law. Now, I do want you to understand there's no amount of following the law that will provide us any grace. James tells us if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all of them. Yesterday, we were witnessing that individual. We only used two. Two of the Ten Commandments. That's it. Two of the Ten Commandments. Lying and stealing, he was guilty of both. Guilty of one, you're guilty of all. There's nobody under the sound of my breath that can fulfill everything in this Bible and think that you'll fulfill it perfectly so that you can earn your way to heaven. It's not going to happen. That's why we're under grace. That's why Jesus Christ came. 
were justified by faith, period, not by works. They recognized it. They understood that. They were a church that was preaching and teaching that. They were a church that was fulfilling God's commands in their life. And now they'd come in conflict, conflict with some false teaching that had now affected the entire church. And they were teaching now that you must be circumcised, which was from the Old Testament law. It was a covenant with Abraham and God. It was a Jewish tradition. And they thought, well, you have to line up with our way of life. Can I just say this to you real quick? It's not your lineage, not your friends, it's not your parents, it's not the church that you attend. None of those things provide you salvation. You with me? None of them. It's only by the grace of God. I repent and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Romans 10, 12, Galatians 3, 28 both say that. We're all the same. Matter of fact, in John 10, Jesus said, any other way is a thief and a robber. Right? He said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth of life. No man come to the Father but by me. But in John 10, he says, I'm the door. Unless you come through the door, you can't enter the pasture. He made it pretty simple, right? You believe in Jesus Christ. He did the finished work. I don't want to continue to go down that road, but I want you to understand that no matter what anybody says pertaining to any liberty, but specifically the gospel, if they say as long as you try to live a good life and you tell other people about Jesus Christ, that you'll get to heaven. Well, listen, friend. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you've never went through the door, and I promise you, according to the scripture, you will hear, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. And I'll promise you this. That's Peter desire. It doesn't have to be that way. Stop trusting what they say and trust what the Word of God says. Now, most everybody in here, I know your testimony. So we're there. Everybody that has talked to me, according to your testimony, uh, you have believed and trusted in Jesus Christ. Praise God. And hopefully we would fight against this perverted gospel that were heresy that would be taught. They've brought it in. And look what he says about this. I said this earlier. Go to Galatians 1 real quick. Galatians 1. Well, it's just one individual. Everything else is right, even though the gospel's not right. Okay. That's okay. I can live of it. I'm strong enough to understand. I'm just going to tell you this. If they don't have the gospel right, then you follow what the Word of God tells us right here. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. This really. That doesn't mean you can't give them the gospel. You can give them the gospel, but you follow what this says. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Jump over to chapter 5. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Our text. He's talking about these folks that are saying perverted the gospel. Look what it says in verse 12. They were even what? Cut off. Which trouble you? Those are bold statements. It's the Bible. The Bible says, you know why? You know why the Bible says that? I, if they're off on salvation, you don't think they're going to be off on anything else? Can I just, are there some doctrines in the Word of God that are somewhat difficult to, to understand? I mean, I would say no, you have the right to be wrong. You'd say the same to me, you have the right to be wrong. There are some things that have been fought and, fought and, fight and, fought, I don't know how you'd say the past tense, fought, there we go, have been fought for hundreds of years, right? Is the gospel hard to understand from the Bible? It's very, very, very simple. If you can't get the simple doctrine of salvation right, why in the world am I going to listen to any other doctrine that you might have? I know that sounds selfish, but you can't, get God, you can't get the gospel right, the whole thing that even gets me in. Can I say this? If you don't have the gospel right, you don't understand what the Word of God is telling you in the first place, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's what the Bible tells me, right? So Paul says, mark them as a curse, avoid them. We say, preacher, that's so mean. We live in 2024, we're going to love everybody. What happened to the church? They're now teaching a perverted gospel. They're now teaching a gospel that is no longer real. Can I just say it point blankly? They are now destroying the truth and leading people straight to a devil's hell. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. For, we would say for salvation. I'm all in. It's a big deal. Can I 
say this, there should be the lights flashing. Danger, danger, danger. A little leaven, leaven the whole lump. Danger, danger, danger. Avoid this thing. But we don't. We walk headlong right into the thing. You can see the fruits of the flesh later, because I'm, I'm sure you're going to go home and read your Bible, right? And you can read verses 17 through 21 and see the fruits of the flesh. I covered pretty intensively there the, the gospel piece, but now I want to move over. We're saved. We have this liberty. We're saved. We, we don't have to follow the law. We don't have a, a checklist of things that we have to do to earn salvation. So that means we can discard the entire book of the Bible and now live how I feel I want to live. Hey, we're all led by the Holy Spirit of God, right? You just follow the Spirit of God as God leads you. That's, that's hocus pocus, just letting you know that. The Spirit of God will never lead you astray from the Word of God. It was our memory verse last week, last month. That was last week. John 16, 13, right? He will speak of the truth. He will guide you into all truth. You with me? The Spirit of God will never, ever, ever, danger, 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 lead you away from his book. Okay? Everybody tracking on me? Too many families, relationships, churches, have been destroyed because people follow the word of God. They want to follow self. Sincere, good people want to follow their own emotions, want to follow their own feelings, and a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. We're talking about a church that heard the gospel from Paul. I'm not worshiping Paul. I'm just saying. That's a pretty close connection to Jesus Christ. Now we're 2,000 years distant from that. And the very things that they wrote about 2,000 years ago, people don't want to listen to truth. People don't want sound doctrine. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse. People are going to come up with their own ideas. People are going to come up with fables. Blah, blah, blah. Right? You with me? 2,000 years later, Look at where we're at. You've got everything under the sun. Why? Liberty for the occasion of the flesh. See, I don't know if I agree with you, preacher. I think I've said it before. I'll say it again. There were three cannabis churches in Colorado Springs. Marijuana. Three of them. You know what they worship? The spirit of cannibalism. Not cannibalism, cannabis. Maybe they, I don't keep my jokes to myself. Three of them. Occasion to the flesh. You say, but we would never get that crazy. Can we just go back to what we've been talking about for two days? When you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God has given you a spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift is to be used where? To edify the body of Christ, which is the church. According to 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to make a comparison. We would look at the cannabis church and say, well, they're crazy. But then we can look in the mirror and say, yeah, God's given me a Holy Spirit gift. I don't have to use it in church. What's the difference? Who has hindered you to obey the truth? So we've been given this liberty. Can I say this? You've been given the greatest gift that, that could ever be given, and that's salvation. And what comes with salvation is the rest of it, that we are now to serve our God. In verse 13, he says, Brethren, we've been called unto liberty. We're saved, but use not liberty for the occasion of the flesh. Why? The occasion to the flesh lead to fornication, adultery, idolatry, and the heresy and murders, drunkenness, verse 21 tells us of this same chapter. So do not use the liberty that you have been given for your own fleshly feelings, but utilize it for, I love, serve one another, verse 13 tells us. For our liberty is not to be utilized for the occasion of the flesh, what makes me feel better. 
go to 2 Timothy. We've got to look at it before we move on. I'm trying to hurry. 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy, William. Uh, look at verse chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And look with me in verse, uh, let me see this, let me see. Twenty-five. So Paul is writing to Timothy, saying, "Hey, listen, these are the things that you're going to be up against, and 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 uh, some of these things are going to cause problems. And what you need to do is strive, be patient. For what? Verse twenty-five. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now we're going to come back and explain that in just a minute. But what is Timothy supposed to use? Go to chapter three, the most probably the third most memorized verse in Scripture, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. What's the next one? Correction. For correction. What's after that? For instruction in righteousness. Pause for effect. Hold the line. So if I want instruction in righteousness, where am I to go? The Word of God. If I want correction according to God, where am I supposed to go? The Word of God. If I want appropriate doctrine and I want reproof in my life that draws me closer to God, where am I supposed to go? The Word of God. Now what happens when an individual steps outside of the Word of God and doesn't live under the umbrella, if you will, or the banner or the instruction of the Bible? They get to what verse 25 in chapter 2 says, they oppose themselves. You say, how do you oppose your this thing called conviction in your life? Hopefully. If you're saved, there's conviction in your life. And when you do something you're not supposed to do, what happens? What happens? Conviction. What is that conviction? You're opposing yourself. You're saying, I want to go this way, and God's trying to pull you this way. And Paul says, listen, you're going to deal with these people time in and time out. And if we're honest and we put up a mirror right now, we'd say, yep, I'm one of those people. How do we deal with it? The Word of God. The Bible is what guides me and directs me down the right road. We're not going to get into this debate, but why do you think there's 300 and some odd different versions? 11, 11 of the whole lot. Could it be that some of those perversions are written for their own gospel? We'll use one. Read the Jehovah Witness Bible, specifically written for their faith. You know what they did? They said, we don't like what God said. Therefore, I'm going to write this thing and fulfill my religion. We'd say, that's nuts. We ain't going to do that. But yet we have freedom in America and the word of God, and we close the thing and say, I'm going to live this thing how I want to live it. Now, Paul says we don't have liberty for the occasion of our flesh, but, but by love serve one another. Praise God, I'm saved, I'm going to live my way. No, 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 that's not what the Bible's saying. Praise God, I'm saved, and now by love, I'm going to serve somebody else. And that is not legalism. That is me living, serving for the other individual. We're not going to re-preach it. But you go to 1 Corinthians 12, and you go to Romans 12. What is the purpose of those gifts? To utilize, to meet the need of the body. Period. That's what it's for. And to let love be without dissimulation, we talked about, right? So God says, you have this issue in your life, and you need help, and this person has this Holy Spirit gift, and he's going to utilize that to give you the encouragement. Now, there's two problems with that. If this individual that needs that is absent, he don't get the help that he needs. If this individual that has the gift is absent, they don't provide the help that's needed for this individual. Are you with me? God doesn't give you liberty to live your life the way you want to. God doesn't give you liberty to skip things. God doesn't give you liberty to have the Holy Spirit gift that God has given you to use or to use whenever you want to. God says, listen, I saved you. I own you. You've been bought by Christ. Now I've blessed you with this spiritual gift to utilize with love to serve other people. Verse 14, he goes deeper with it. He says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Turn to Luke 10. Luke 10. Now, while you're turning to Luke 10, I want you to look to your left and to your right. Look to your left and to your right. 
Now, we normally sit around people that we're comfortable with, right? Yeah, take a deep breath. I'm not going to pick on you. We do, don't we? Don't, don't we normally sit around people that we like, people that we love, right? So we say, oh, thank you, Lord. You saved me, and now I get to serve and love my neighbor. Praise God. I'm glad I like Tom. He's my neighbor. But now this old boy, <laughs> I'm not so sure I like him. This fella right here, yeah, that's definitely not my neighbor. I know he's born again, and I know he's biblically baptized, and I know he's a, a member at Anchor Baptist Church, but he's fill in the blank, however you want to fill it in. Thank God I don't have to love him because he's not my neighbor. He's my neighbor. Luke chapter 10, Jesus is going to define for us what a neighbor is. Look there really fast. Verse 27, 29, there's a rich old boy that's uh, questioning Jesus Christ like they always do. And they have this thing going back and forth. He's a lawyer. And uh, Jesus asks him, what do you do? And he answers in 27, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus said, yep, you answered right. He willing to justify himself, verse 29, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You ask a question, you might not like the answer. The demon departed leaving. There's a naked probably bleeding. We had wounds, so we know that he's bleeding. He's been beat up, and he's laying in the middle of the road half dead. I'm not trying to be stupid or funny. Is that the individual you want to hang out with? The person that you want to go and shake hands with? person that you want to go and be around. I'm just saying, this, this old boy's half dead, stripped naked, beat up, laying in the middle of the road. That's the individual. By chance, that way, and when he saw him, he passed by. So we have the religious crowd. This individual would be the priest, passes by, looks, there's no one to do with that. Two, we got a Levite. A Levite would be a worker, right? right? Let's say we'll just go with a blue collar individual. This is an individual that would serve in the, in the temple and be a worker of the temple, right? So he walked down the road and he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side too. So we got the religious crowd who knows the law, passes on by. We got the working crowd that says, I got too much service to do. I got too many things to do. So uh, good luck, Godspeed. And he goes on by. There's a third individual. Who's a Samaritan, and nobody likes them if you're Jewish and you're listening to this. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and he saw him, and he had what? Something different here. He had compassion on him. Let me, let me read this verse again from our text. So this individual comes down a road, and he has something different than the rest of them. He has compassion. Now... The Bible said, Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look to our left and right, we're happy who we're sitting next to. But probably who you're sitting next to is half beaten down and no good. Something different about this individual than the religious guy and the service guy. To him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Now, something happened with this compassion. He was moved to service. His heart was touched and he moved to do something. Now, how do we know death? Of love. You know the story. Could that individual give him an individual that half dead beaten? Would that bring in any glory? Bring that Samaritan Would that bring that thing that could that individual bring anything for the Samaritan? Absolutely. Unfeigned love. He has compassion. Cleans him up, puts him in an inn. Because if that's And whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Jesus says, which one was it? 
The guy says, he that showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. All three of them had liberty to decide to do what they wanted to do. The priest could have said he's on his way to make a visit. I don't know. He's on his way to sacrifice a turtle dove so he can fulfill what needs to be done. The Levite could have said, I got a candle to take care of. I got some showbread to put on the table. I, I got some sweeping up to do. I got some blood to clean up. Ultimately, that's what both of them did. But the third one, the Samaritan, who the Jewish people did fight, is the one that had compassion and gave of himself without any return. Gave of himself, not seeking any gain. That's what Christ is asking of you. That you would love, serve, help, encourage one another as thy neighbor. 1 Corinthians 12 really explains the body of Christ and it goes into depth. For time, I'm not going to go there, but... It says that one that you think is the least is the one that we need to bestow the greatest honor on. When we think that the pinky toe is not important, <laughs> you stub it, the pinky toe is a big deal. Hard to walk when your pinky toe is busted up. Can I say that it's hard for the church to fulfill what needs to be done when the pinky toe is busted up? You might think it's nothing, but the Bible says it's something. Spiritual gift is just, I don't get to preach. No, but you might have the gift of ministries. You might have the gift of helps. You might have the gift of mercy. You might have whatever other gift that's in there, right? And that gift is to be used by what? We talked about it for two weeks straight. To bring love, help, support, and encouragement. Specifically to Anchor Baptist Church. But it's not a big deal. Little leaven leavens a whole lump. It's following the devil, it's not following God. It's in disobedience of by love serve one another. It's in disobedience of love thy neighbor as thyself. There's no doubt we're commanded to use our gift, whether it's ministry, help, administration, teaching, preaching, giving, exhorting, mercy, whatever it is within the local New Testament church. We don't get the liberty to take the gift that God's given us and use it how we want to use it. Does that make sense? Go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 13. The Bible says once we're saved, the Holy, Spirit give, the Holy Spirit gift is given. The Bible says once we're saved, we're forever in Christ. The Bible says those that were saved and baptized were added unto the church. The whole New Testament writings, I shouldn't say the whole, a majority of the New Testament writings are specifically about church. And if we know, if we have a sincere heart to try to do, quote unquote, good, won't do it the way that God says it, that is disobedience. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin, is what James says. God designed this whole thing. God owns us, so God says, this is what you must, will do it if you're going to follow and be in obedience. Again, who doth hinder you from obeying the truth? I'm not saying some of those people aren't sincere. I'm not saying some of those people are nice. The devil's an angel of light. The devil's seeking who he may devour. He's a, he's a stinking lion. He's not no cat. Cats are evil too, but he's not no cat. He's a lion seeking how he may devour you. A wolf comes in dressed in sheep clothing. Why? To befriend you? To help your family? To encourage you? To lead? No. They come in to devour. That's it. Devour. A wolf showed up in sheep's clothing to devour the church of Galatia. To stop the spreading of the gospel. You say, how'd they do it? You get circumcised after you believe in Jesus Christ. But preacher, nobody does that anymore today. You got to speak in tongues after you believe Jesus Christ. You got to get water baptized after you believe in Jesus Christ. You got to become a member of a church after you believe in Jesus Christ. Then you can have a home in heaven. No different. It's a perverted gospel. 
And Paul said, if I did it, or an angel did it, if anybody else, mark him as a curse. It's a big deal. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8 says this. He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. This is Saul. Saul's had a victory with the Philistines. He's supposed to make an offering, a sacrifice. He's supposed to be waiting on Samuel to show up. Saul's anointed of God to be the king. Saul knows that a sacrifice is good for God. God uh, Saul knows that an offering is right. Saul also knows he doesn't have the authority to do Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end, I love it, your sin will find you out. <laughs> Pleasure and sin for a season, as soon as, the Bible says. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? Saul said, well, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and, and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philippines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made application unto the supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt sacrifice. Saul says, in Dean Francini's way, yes, Samuel, I know you're the priest. Uh, the prophet, I know you're the one to make the offering. I know that's God's command. I know that's God's law. But you don't understand. There was a problem in a situation. And, and I know how to make offerings. And I know how to make sacrifices. So you do understand, God, you do understand that I just stepped aside for this, this one purpose to do something good. What hast thou done? The kingdom will be rendered from you. Saul lost the kingdom. Walked away from the blessings of God. Walked away from the obedience of God. Even though he did something that was good. But it was not according to God. And I promise you. I watched a clip the other day that said. What you make. Oh, I'm going to mess it up. What you make optional. The next generation will make obsolete. What you make optional the next generation will make obsolete. In other words, we don't have to go to church. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to pray. You don't have to follow God's ways. Just do the best that you can. What that statement is saying is the next generation is going to make it obsolete. Well, it was optional for my parents, and I, I'm not going to do it. It was optional for my parents, and I don't need to apply that. I'm not giving you... For those things, right? The Bible does say if we're famine of the word of God, the next generation won't know God. You could go back to the Old Testament and see that there was a generation that knew not God. Why? Because it was optional to those people. With me? A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Saul said, it's just a sacrifice and an offering. I know how to do it. I'll go ahead and do it. Samuel said, what has thou done? Rent the whole kingdom from Saul. Because he wanted to do something that he thought was good outside of what he knew God said. Can I just ask you really quickly, and we'll close. Number one, if you don't repent and ask Jesus Christ to save you and trust only in his work on the cross of Calvary, where will you wake up? In hell. There's only one way to get to heaven. It's in Jesus Christ. Just a question. If you've now been saved and you have liberty and you decide this morning, I'm not going to serve one another with love. I'm going to take what God's given me and do it however I want to do it. What's God going to say to you? Who hindered you from following the truth? You're not going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know where you're going to end up? With a rent kingdom. Your life in shambles and a mess. You're going to say, God, what happened to my kids? God, what happened to my marriage? God, what happened to my work? God, what happened to my life? And God's going to be over here saying, I told you in Scripture not to utilize this liberty for the occasion of your flesh. I gave you guidance. I gave you direction. And if it's enough to save you, it's enough to lead and guide you. Don't rent the kingdom. Don't destroy it.
Don't fall for the fleshly feelings. I read some of them, but you can read them yourself. Galatians 5, 17, all the way down to 21. It's not good fruit. It's not good fruit. God doesn't give us that thing to make us legalistic robots. He gave us that thing so that we can live according to his will, his way, his instruction, in his love, in his power, to receive his blessings. Please don't deceive yourselves into thinking you know and can do better. You can't. You can't. So what will it be this morning? Your way or God's way? Let me just make it more direct. The devil's way or God's way? Will it be okay for you to not obey the truth? God's given us all a Holy Spirit gift. Jesus Christ died for the church. And we're told right here to use our liberty with love, serve one another. If we don't, we hinder the truth. Father, thank you, Lord. Truth's been preached this morning. I pray, Father, that anything that I might have said that was distracting, that you just remove it, Lord. What I do pray is that we would honestly do business in our hearts and our lives for you, God. Lord, I'm thankful for the church, God. I know it's not perfect. That fellow yesterday said, well, there's a bunch of hypocrites. There sure is. We're all sinners saved by grace. Paul laid a whole list out to those people. He said there's murderers and liars and fornicators and all this junk in there. He said such were some of you. Lord, we're all sinners saved by grace, but we're all flesh. We're weak. We're so quick to do what we want. We're so quick to follow the way of the world. We're so quick to hit up entertainment, God. We're so quick to utilize your grace in vain. We're so quick to take the liberty that you provided for us and use it for the occasion of the flesh. And we get this mindset. that I ain't got to do all that. Church, church is not important. Instruction of the word of God is not important. God, help us. Help us, Lord. You've given us these things to protect us and to provide for us. Bless us, God. May we see it that way. We get in the flesh and go the way of the world, Lord. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. There's no The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. God, I know there are good people in here, Lord. Good people that you love, and I know they love you. I pray that we would all take that love, not use it for the flesh, but use it to serve one another. That we'd all be willing to fulfill the gift that you've given us in your local place. Whatever gift we may have, God, use it for you. Maybe, as I said last week, we're not sure what our gift is. We'd get serious about figuring it out. And Lord, then we'd get serious about it for you. If it's the lowly and down and out, Lord, if they're a member of Anchor Baptist Church, they deserve honor. They deserve our love. People we can't quite get along with, God, may our hearts change that we get along with them. Why? Because of love and compassion, as we've seen from that Samaritan. And God, may this really stick in our heads. Yes, we may be trying to do good, but in our own way, it costs all the kingdom. Who or what hinders us from obeying the truth, Lord? Pray for your protection, your watch care. I pray that you bless the invitation. Lord, if somebody here is trusting in a perverted gospel, God, I pray that you'd help them to understand there's no amount of works that they can do. It's been done by Jesus Christ. Lord, may they come forward and be saved this morning. Lord, I pray those of us that are, we really, really, really think seriously and hard. We live in a free country. We've been given liberty. But may we use it by love to serve one another. Father, you bless the invitation. Please, we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.